All right, guys. Welcome to today's webinar. This, these are these are fun. I think this is number seven or something like that. Let's see here. SeekXR.com. By the way, if you ever uh, want to watch past episodes, they're all on SeekXR.com. You just click on the insights. Yeah, it looks like last week was episode six, and uh, and yeah, I've I, I missed. I missed a couple of these. We didn't do one, and then and then I wasn't on the I wasn't on the uh, last one. Life's life's crazy and busy, and I was traveling, so um, I couldn't be there. But grateful to very strong team members who can who can jump on and talk about cool stuff. So today, um, I don't think we've brought Mike on before. Mike is my co-founder here at Seek. Um, has been here from the very beginning and all the way through. Um, yeah, there's nobody at, at, at Seek that's been around longer than, than Mike, except for me. And uh, we've, yeah, we've had a, a great ride. <laughs> it's been a fun, crazy ride. And, um, you know, when, when Mike and I started this business, um, it actually was not a, a uh, it wasn't a Web3 business, obviously. Web3 wasn't even being talked about back in 2016. Um, and it wasn't even an augmented reality business at the time. It was a treasure hunting business. And uh, we just wanted to go do something fun, right? We were both, we had both done some, I don't know, normal jobs, <laughs> sales jobs and other things working for tech companies. And, and we said, let's go do something fun. Uh, those were, uh, those were good days on the whiteboard. And up in the mountains, started in a completely up. different field. Yeah. yeah. We had a, we started out of my basement here in Utah, in Highland, Utah, in a house that lived in at the time. And Mike, didn't you move in at some point? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we would yeah. literally, yeah. So he moved into the house in Highland. And we worked out of the basement and then we got a couple more people on board and then we rented a bigger house in Alpine to another basement, to another basement and made that entire basement, the office. And, and one, one we had whiteboards like all the way around it. I know, we had whiteboards just everywhere in the room and we would just make things up. And that was really, really fun times. Um, and, um, and yeah, Mike and I would literally work all the time. Like we would, we would wake up, and just walk downstairs and just get to work on things and come up with ideas. And Mike and I just like to talk about business ideas and I'm sure my wife hated it, but, um, but we just would do it. And then, and then we just work all day and then we're already home. And so we just keep working. <laughs> we like go upstairs. Maybe we keep talking about things. And anyway, um, startups are crazy. They're fun. Um, and now here we are six, seven years later and we're in a little bit better office. I don't know if anybody has, I don't know if I've given a tour to the webinar crowd, at least of the office, um, but we're, we're four, we just did a, a head count. I think we're 42 employees now and, and um, with another two getting offers this week. And so we're, we're growing fast and we're excited to be here. And, and, and this growth has come because the world has changed and now we're, we're much more focused on this web three world that, uh, you know, we've been focused on AR and VR and XR and metaverse and all that stuff for a long time. But, uh, but by adding blockchain to the mix, it, it has you know, expanded the ways in which we can serve our customers in a, in a pretty significant way. And so that's exciting. Um, about, let's see here, we're April 19th. So about, I think it was at the Christmas, the Christmas party. Um, we, um, Mike's been our chief operating officer from the very beginning. And then in, um, in December, we made a switch. And one thing that Mike was doing before Seek um, and has always and has done several things. He's done some startups in, in. Um, why don't you talk about it a little bit, Mike? Some of the things you've done around like food and preservation yep. and conservation and things like that. Just just talk about that for a minute, and then and then I'll keep going here. Sure. Yeah. So I, back in college, I uh, did a startup. My second startup was um, before Seek was in the um, freeze dry industry, and we asked us me and my co founder asked ourselves the question how can we preserve all of the excess food that we have in the system and make it so we actually save more of that food and less people go hungry? Because I think we, we did the math and about 20 to 40% of food isn't even leaving the farms and grocery stores. Um, it just goes to a food bank or gets thrown away or you know, gets rots underneath an apple tree. Or like if 800 million people around the world are going hungry and 30% of food isn't leaving the farm, 
you know, there's got to be some way that we could preserve that extra food and, and, and diversify across all those different people that are hungry. And so we bought a freeze dry machine, partnered with some um, local grocery stores, put one into a Harmon's grocery store here in Utah and started preserving their extra strawberries and peaches and apples before it went, you know, got so ripe that they needed to either throw it away or, or donate it. Um, so I've always kind of been environmentally minded. Um, and so that kind of fits really well in with my new role here at SEEK. Yeah, so um, so in December, we announced to, you know, to everybody that we were, we were moving Mike over to a little bit different role. And we brought in, a, you know, someone else to be COO, which is mostly just boring stuff, making sure people get paid and operations, HR. the company is running HR, all that stuff. And, you know, um, and put something on the, you know, put Mike on something that's, that's really exciting and that's ESG. Um, and for those of you that don't know what ESG is, um, what does it stand for, Mike? Environmental, social, and governance. Yeah. And, and what does that mean to us? Yeah. So for us, I mean, ESG, you guys see it in the, in the news a lot. Um, I mean, basically it means focusing on making the planet, you know, more sustainable, better, less emissions. That's the environment. Social is doing well for the people and the communities. So the best example someone gave me was if a mining operation comes into Peru, goes in, mines up all the resources, and then just takes, you know, leave, leaves rich and fat and then leaves the you know people poor and, and um, you know in despair that's not doing well by for the community and then G is G is for governance and that means basically doing the right thing um, uh, fiduciary responsibilities which we're seeing in the news a lot right now with Twitter's board right they have they're in this weird situation where people are saying that they should take one offer but then other people are saying that they shouldn't and so they're stuck in this bind of making the right fiduciary responsibility for the shareholders. Um, so that's the governance portion, so ESG. Um, but at SEEK, we like to focus on three, three parts of it, people, planet, and profit. Um, because a lot of the controversy comes with, well, hey, if we're just focusing on the environment and it's not sustainably, it's sustainable on an you know, economics basis, then what's the point of it all, right? If the companies are just going bankrupt. And at Seek, we believe we can balance all of those. And I'll talk some talk about some of our partners in a little bit too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, people, planet, and profits, like all of that, all of that matters. You can you can do a lot of good. And and, and we believe that both sides of, of the business that we that we have kind of here at Seek that really all comes into one is you've got this this visualization side, the metaverse, XR, AR, 3D, all of that. There's an insane amount of things that we can do to help the world, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and and then blockchain, we believe, is an incredibly efficient way to be able to drive the same goals. Um, and and a lot of people don't usually attach blockchain to ESG because it's so, you know, heavy on the compute side, right? And well, if you use Ethereum, you're right. <laughs> Bitcoin, you're right. Um, but the ways that we're approaching things are just a little bit different, and. Um, and we're, and we're trying to make decisions and do, for example, everything that we can process off-chain, we'll, we'll process off-chain. And then only when we need to, will we go onto the blockchain. And then when we need to go on the blockchain, we'll make sure we use something that's very, very efficient, something like Immutable X or something like um, Polygon or Celo or other, these other chains that are um, proof of stake and therefore using a, a thousand X, a hundred thousand X less um, energy than uh, than some of these other solutions that have been out there. And so we're taking uh, whatever approaches we can to, to not only you know, do as little you know, harm to the environment, but that also helps with profit too. If we're doing something that requires a lot less resources, it's also going to be more profitable. And so we've, um, you know, we have to build a business that allows us to pay you know, the, the people that are, are putting their lives, um, you know, they're dedicating their lives to SEEK and, and to everything that we're doing here. And we're really excited for all of our employees and grateful for them and all of their hard work. Um, and that's, of course, you know, the people side of things. It's not, it's, and it's not just our employees. Everything we do, we hope, can benefit our customers, those that interact with our customers and, and, and the whole chain all the way down. So, um, so let's talk for a minute, Mike. Let's just, let's just kind of um, chat a little bit about um, how, how XR, like, the, the, the journey that a product, for example, can take, let's take a shoe company, right? We'll make up a new shoe company. Um, 
and we'll take, you know, shoe company X, right? X shoes. And, and how can they use 3D AR from the beginning all the way through to the end? Like, and, and, and what is, how does that impact everything we're talking about here? Yep, yep, great question. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen just for some graphics. Let's go, okay. So, um, I, so at Seek, like as John mentioned, we, we can actually improve the environment. So returns, as everyone on this call knows, is, is a huge problem. It's like hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars every year are returned just from Amazon, let alone the rest of the internet. I think it's something like a trillion dollars a yep. year globally. I yeah. think it's a trillion because of the, the trends in e-commerce growing, growing. Yep. Um, and just, you know, Amazon's like 50% of that. Um, so it's a huge problem. XR solves a portion of, of that problem by helping customers make a better decision. Being able to see that shoe created by, you know, that X shoe created by X company. Um, but one thing that Seek is doing going further is adding in partners along the whole supply chain from creation of the shoe to the shopping experience where we, where we, our technology lies and all the way to the delivery of the shoe. And so I'll kind of take you through a journey with some of our customers that have some of our client partners in the ESG space. So from manufacturing, we've got Manifest Commerce. So they're a third-party logistics company that makes sure that the whole you know, manufacturing facility in Vietnam is as, um, as sustainable and environmentally um, sound as, as possible. They're in, an incredible company. Once it leaves their, their company and goes to, let's say, the company's warehouse, right, where the shoes are stored, we then partner with EcoCart that can um, offset the shipping of that shoe. So if John buys X shoe um, and he's in Salt Lake City and the shoe's being shipped from Boston, um, where it's at the warehouse, EcoCart will actually has an algorithm to track the distance and the route and the partner and figure out how much carbon emissions are gonna be um, set off into the environment from that shipment. And what they do is they actually put, it's a free service, but they put a little plug in and a box that says, hey, would you like to pay 75 cents to, to make this a carbon neutral purchase? John as a customer can say, yep, 75 cents, boom, and it's done. Um, awesome, super yeah. easy. Super easy. Um, we also have, so Climate Trade is another good one for offsetting the corporate um, emissions. So someone like Seek could be a climate of climate trade and just say, hey, you know, we've got 50 employees um, in 12 different states here, you know, and then they'll help us estimate our, our you know, carbon emissions with all of our, you know, people driving to work, our office, everything. Um, there's a few more I wanted to share while we're on this, while I'm sharing. Um, this is a cool one that my dad actually um, introduced me to that he uses. Um, it's called the Good Traveler, and it's the same premise as EcoCart, but for flights. So, John, if you're going on a business trip to Taiwan, you can plug in. You literally just put in your Delta number, and they'll they'll um, you know cal do the calculation for you. And then same thing as EcoCart, you choose. Hey, yep, I'd love to spend you know twenty eight dollars or whatever it is, and, and offset the carbon emissions for that trip. Um, then and they're doing just so I understand what Good Traveler and EcoCart are doing. Are they basically are, are they planting trees? Are they like what are they doing exactly with that seventy five cents or twenty eight dollars? Yep. So their company does the calculations and creates or it goes out and creates partnerships. I think EcoCart has somewhere between twenty and thirty different agricultural and other partners that are doing ESG. Um, let's see, certified. They're creating certified carbon credits. Got it. And so that, that could be planting trees or cleaning up a beach. Um, and, and it has to be certified by um, a third party. Yeah. So then they, they vet those for us, which is cool. Um, the last one here is kind of interesting for what we're doing with um, Seek's new blockchain-based platform that's actually launching this week. Um, it's called Offsetra. So Offsetra actually has a calculator here where you can take your, um, your Ethereum address and it'll actually tell you how much carbon emissions you've you've done. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So I'll, I'll put that in the chat for anyone who wants to play with it. But it's it's kind of fun. Um, I personally have 
I'm responsible for 469 kilograms of CO2 emissions. So then how do you offset? Yeah, click, click that. So what would that cost you yep. to, if you wanted so, to offset that? Yeah, so I can go to Offsetra. I can spend 5.88. Oh, there you go. So tons, you done what, 479? Uh, 469. 469, so put that number in. <laughs> they, they did it for me. No, 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 isn't it one right there up, up so, above? Oh, that's one ton. That's to offset one ton. Exactly. So you got to get 469. This is going to get my, 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 mine, was, mine was kilograms. Oh, was it? Okay. Well, then yeah. what is that? So, so one ton, one ton is only going to cost 5.88 uh, pounds. 469 kilograms and a ton is 2,000 pounds or about 800. So, so yeah, you're about, you're actually about half a ton is about yeah. where you are right now. So, so really, you, you, you owe like, you owe like three pounds. Yep. And so if I, if I hit this right now, I can offset yeah. it with a wind project across get it. rural parts of Asia. <laughs> kind of slick. I'll put that in the chat for you guys. That's pretty fun. That's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah so obviously everybody that's, that's listening to this and, and, and watching right now, um, you know, you're, you're in web three, you're probably, you've probably spent money on an Ethereum wallet somewhere, a MetaMask, and you've probably done something. And so we want to do our best. There's a lot of companies out there that are working on on creating these kind of things, but but we definitely care about this this side of the the world. We want to make the world a better place, um, not only directly related to what we're doing, but also make sure that we're, you know, uh, being responsible global citizens. Um, you know, back to X shoes as an example. And Mike, you probably stop sharing that so we yeah. can Go get us it. back up again. Or maybe you should just keep sharing so you don't have to look at our faces so close. But um, but anyway, so. Back to X shoe company is an example of how we can help on the on the ESG side. Um, we had a very very large company, uh, or we have we actually are kind of in the middle of conversations with with uh, with a with a big company that wants to be able to use three D from concept all the way to you know consumer interaction and purchasing, right? And so let's say you're designing a shoe, the 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 you know traditional process would be, all right, let's draw some things and let's come up with a prototype and maybe we model it out in CAD even, and then we're going to send it over to, we're going to send that, you know, whatever over to Asia or somewhere where it's going to get then manufactured, then that's going to get shipped back over to headquarters where they can look at it and say, ah, oh, we don't like this, change this, change this, change this, they ship it back or whatever, right? I mean, there's a lot of shipping back and forth with just one shoe or just one product, right? And some of these, some of these companies, I mean, Mike, one of our customers is Wolverine. How many products across their 15 brands do they have annually? Oh. Is it, it 5,000, 10,000, 15,000? Oh, probably well, across all 13 brands, it's probably tens of thousands. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And so we're talking about one shoe here, yeah. right? Now, obviously they can probably do it in batches. Maybe they'll do 10 shoes at a time. But the point is there's a lot of inefficiency there, moving things around and, and, and having to do that. Some companies, some shoe companies, newer ones that are thinking about these types of issues have done things like... Uh, great where they buy the factory and then they can like design and print and do everything so there is no shipping there they can just kind of do it all right there or they'll or they'll manufacture more locally so they can reduce that but but ultimately with 3d you can say hey here's my idea and then you can use a virtual try on to put it on your foot or to use 3d and put it right in front of you in fact let's just pull one up really quick right just an example of a shoe um let's see here um Let's pull up something fun here. So we'll just do a pretty traditional whatever here. All right, let's share screen for just a moment here. Okay, so you can see we've got a Sperry shoe, right? It's awesome. This is a women's boat shoe and it's great. Now you can, if you're watching this webinar, I'll put, leave this up for a second. You can scan this with a QR code and now you can try it in front of you. This is not hooked up to a, an actual foot try on, but we can do that too. But you have the ability to look at it, look at all sides and see all this and essentially be able to make a decision on, hey, do we like this? Is this, is this something that we want to, that we want to manufacture at scale? And, and once you get it to where at least visually you're like, yeah, this looks great, right? Obviously you can't try fit. You don't know what the leather feels like, but they know these things because they're, they're, make, they're controlling this process, right? But then you can go from here and say, okay, 
We, you go back and forth with design teams. You can even put it in front of focus groups and have people say, oh yeah, I don't like the blue color. Or, I like the blue color. Or, it's too narrow. Or, it's too wide. Or I don't like the shape here. Or it'd be better if this color was different. You do all these iterations before you've ever printed it even once, right? And then once you feel like you're at a pretty good spot, then you can finally do that once and you can eliminate potentially, first of all, how much time does it take just to ship something back and forth, right? And so you, you get to the product, right? Now you're at the product you've got. Now that 3D model doesn't just like go in the garbage now. Now that 3D model goes onto X shoes or in that case, Sperry, Sperry's website where you can then try it on. You can see it, you can feel it, you can do all that stuff. And so you can be, you can make, as Mike said earlier, a better buying decision the first time, right? Reduce returns. And, and all of that, right? You can make better decisions and then you can put it on social and you can use it in all kinds, you use it in the metaverse, right? Now you, can, now you can actually take that as an asset that your avatar could wear. So being able to take that 3D model and push it a long ways down the road and eliminate potentially thousands of miles of freight back and forth on an annual basis for a big company like we were talking about, that's, that's crazy. That is a huge, huge impact, positive impact on the world to be able to do the entire process using 3D models. And, and this, isn't, this isn't new, right? Um, people have been doing some elements of this, but, but most companies still do a lot of this, the, the shipping, right? They're not equipped to deal with 3D um, at scale. And that's, and that's where we come in, right? So we're excited to be able to offer those types of things. Um, any other comments, any comments on that element, Mike? No, I think it's, right. it's awesome. Yeah, that's great. What else is um, what else? What else are you uh, looking at in ESG? I mean, obviously you've got some of our partners. What do you look? What else are you looking at at Seek? Where um, that's exciting to you? That that sounds fun. So I, I'm really excited for the launch of our new platform. We alluded talk about little, that a little bit. Yeah. So um, we've got some incredible investors and groups and schools that are about to use it. Even just telling people in my local community that I just found another guy that runs a big Instagram channel that wants to use our new platform. It's basically going to be a community infused with blockchain and XR, everything that we just mentioned, um, and a bunch of other things. So we'll be able to have ticketing and um, marketing and other features within this ecosystem. And, and we're really taking the best of all the Web3 stuff that we've been doing over the last six years and combining with the latest in, in NFTs, right? Being able to do cross-chain deployment with um, Polygon, right? It'll be built on the Polygon network. So basically, you know, yeah, go ahead. Same, I, I never actually thought, I was just thinking something, you know, ESG is obviously environment, social governance, environmental social governance, but social is actually a middle word there. And with, with our new NFT platform that is launching soon, which we're going to present to you guys really soon. It might be the next webinar. It might be the next one after that. Um, but, but it basically allows for a complete reorganization of social interaction, right? Is decentralizing it, right? Essentially what we're doing guys is we're allowing, we're allowing people to, um, through to, to use blockchain NFTs and a wallet to be able to manage community access. And all of this stuff will happen right on people's websites, right? And so back to the X shoes example, if they want a community of people that wear their shoes and they want interactions to happen with their community, what do they do today? They go to centralized platforms like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, um, and they have to manage Twitter, right? They have to manage all of these, these profiles. And, and the problem is, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy. There's, there's big groups out there like, uh, like Dude Perfect, for example, mm -hmm. who have spent basically their whole professional lives <laughs> making videos that they then publish to a really cool platform called YouTube. And YouTube's cool. Don't get me wrong. I spend plenty of time on there and I like it. But as a creator, I'm not a big fan of it. And they, they feel the same way too. And because I've talked to those groups, specific, those guys specifically, and there's many other groups out there that, that they're, they're worried about the fact that they don't really own their content, right? Um, YouTube will take content from whoever gives it to them. And then 
they get to monetize it however the heck they want. You as the creator don't even get to choose how it's monetized. You don't get to choose which ads go on there. You can choose whether or not there are ads on there. So you can choose whether or not to monetize it, right? But most content on YouTube is monetized. That's how they make their living. But YouTube is the one that takes the lion's share of it. You get a million views, you get a thousand bucks. That's crazy, right? And, and so um, we are using our NFT platform to flip that narrative to where creators can, can put their content onto their website and then use blockchain technology to help bring in their entire community into that platform, manage the platform and allow for people, remember people is one of our you know, things, right? Planet people profits or to allow real interactions with real people um, inside of their community. You know, right now, Instagram is really one to many. And we believe that one to one is what people are really looking for. Even if the community is smaller than the number of followers you have on Twitter, if you can really have true one to one conversations with people um, that mean something um, through our technology, I think that'll be awesome. And I know I'm saying very high level, you know, I'm placating here a little bit. And I'm doing that on purpose because I want to I want to show it rather than just talk about it. And so we'll we'll do that. We'll do that soon. But but I agree, Mike, that's exciting. The new platform is going to realign social in a lot of really exciting ways and and allow for fans or members of communities to be able to interact in ways that they've never done before. And I think that's going to be really, really exciting. I agree. Me and Novak had a good question. They said, what's the advantage of 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 this new platform that we're launching versus an open C. I kind of hinted at some things, but you can, you could probably touch on that. Oh, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things and we'll have yeah. to show it to you to, to really help you understand it. But one major flaw in open C is there is no community. It's just yeah. a, it's just a listing site. Yep. It literally just posts a bunch of things for sale. That is all that open C does. Like, it's like e eBay for, for NFTs. NFTs, yeah. And yeah, there's no there's no commenting, there's no community, right? In order to find the community, you gotta leave and go elsewhere, right? You gotta go find the community. Um, and for some people, for people that are maybe listening to this webinar, maybe that seems easy to you jumping on a Discord. But uh, but for my dad, for my mom, for even my sisters that are not into NFTs, those are unfamiliar platforms a little bit, right? And uh, and so we want to make it so that um so that that community, that communication, those things happen uh, in an easier way that is more in control and more owned, more specifically by the community and owned by the users, the members of that community, right? And so um, we're doing some pretty neat stuff over here and I'm really excited. I'm really excited about that. Um, you know, for the next, uh, we'll, we'll finish this. We, don't, we, we won't go the full hour today, but for the next 10 minutes, Mike, unless you have anything else to add to that, I'd like to kind of shift gears a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about just like what's exciting in in the crypto world and the NFT world. Yeah. There's been some there's been some things that have happened the last few days. Um, the uh, Moonbirds. Who knows about Moonbirds, Mike? I don't even know if I've talked to you about Moonbirds. Oh. But um, someone someone texted me this 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 time. I'm gonna I'm gonna just share this. Let's see if I can pull up this. Uh, this photo here, let's see here. Uh, yeah, yeah, this will this will work. Okay, so share screen. All right, so here's the shoe again. That's fine, but this is what I wanted to pull up. So this was just a a, a tweet or a LinkedIn. I'm not sure what platform this is, but look at this. Two hundred and ten million dollars in just two days. Moonbirds are wow. a collection of ten thousand pixelated owls. Released by entrepreneur Kevin Rose, founder of Proof. Each token sold for two and a half ETH. On minting alone, the launch made $75 million. In 24 hours, the price of each token went from two and a half ETH to 20 ETH. Whoa. Secondary market has already moved $200 million in 24 hours. So obviously, Proof and Kevin Rose are an established brand with a large audience. Um, so it's not really overnight success. You can't just do that, yeah. right? But they can be nested. There's cool utility to these to these tokens. And that's why this one's kind of neat. Um, again, the value isn't necessarily in the pixelated owl picture, right? That's cool. That's just fun, and fun is great. So there's there's no problem with that. But there's actually utility that will allow for some really cool things. But you can actually nest them, and you can generate additional tokens and value if you just 
nest them, which I think is fun to have a bird sit in a nest. So um, you're essentially staking them. Mm -hmm. So moonbirds is cool. That's something that's that's big right now. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, in general, the crypto market is down a little bit over the last month or so. Um, it's it's just kind of trading sideways, right? It's just kind of going up and down, but not in huge swings either way. Um, kind of generally down a little bit, I guess overall. But um, but I'm still very very bullish. I'm still I'm still in the crowd that when somebody says uh, Bitcoin is going to 100,000 by the end of the year, I'm I'm with them. I agree. I agree with that statement. What's standing out to you, Mike? Um, I mean, other than the Giddy, the local company here that's trying to make DeFi easier for people, I know that- Talk about that one. That one's me, big. For me personally, like getting into DeFi, decentralized finance or DeFi, um, as, as opposed to centralized finance, which is where we've been living for decades, um, DeFi is upending the financial world as we know it. Um, to be able to send your own money anytime without having to wait three days, you know, three to five business days and talk to someone and, you know, be questioned, you know, why you're withdrawing money and all of, all of the things that we hate about, you know, working with a traditional bank. Uh, it's just fascinating work, work in the decentralized finance uh, or like invest in it. Um, and we, there's a local company here that's trying to make it easier. The problem with it is it is the wild west and it's hard and there's a lot of steps and details and words. And so getting, someone new, even if they're young and tech savvy, it still takes, it's like a whole learning process to get into the, this new financial system that's been created. But once you're in and you understand it, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. But there's a local company here called Giddy that is launching an app here in a couple months that is going to take all the complexity of and the back end stuff, all the clicking and creating wallets and seed phrases and passwords and bridging tokens, all the things that people hear these words and they're like, I, I, I'm just overwhelmed by that. They're going to take all of the complexity out of it and make it one, one or two clicks, you know, a few clicks, both the on-ramp, meaning get your money into the, into the system and to, to earn passive yield. Um, it's really incredible. And, and one thing that I think is interesting is that typically those yields have been reserved for the centralized exchanges that we work in, they get those fees, right? Someone made a good point. I think they said the, the founder of Coinbase actually made more than the founder of Bitcoin, which is fascinating, right? He literally made the, or whoever the founder of Bitcoin is. Satoshi. Yeah, Satoshi. He's made, or he made the best appreciating asset of all time. Went up like 69 million percent or something crazy from a penny to 69,000. Um, but he didn't make as much as some of the guys that are launching crypto exchanges, right? Like Brian Armstrong at Coinbase. So it's just fascinating. And so decentralized finance is, is, demo is democratizing those gains, I should say, and making it so that anyone can, can get, you know, some, a piece of that growth. And we're, we are truly in the wild west of, of this industry. Um, I also heard someone say a funny quote, they're like, if you're just getting into crypto, you're both late and early. And, and anyone who's in it knows, knows how true that statement is. It's, you're so late and that's so much, like so much has happened in such a short span of time, but then you're also so early because there's so much potential. Um, there's so much to figure out that hasn't been figured out. Exactly. Right. Like we, we, we've talked about on this, on this webinar series, you know, some of the ways, for example, NFTs can and will be used, right? Like, as a as a deed to a house right or a title to a house or other you know physical ownership right and and yeah we're we're early you know in that because that's a few years out maybe maybe a decade out before it's mass adopted right yep but um but it's also been around it's also been around right and the internet went through the same thing right if you think back in the 90s the, like, the late 90s is when it really started to get popular in the big boom Mm -hmm. But I remember logging onto the internet in 1992, 1993, mm -hmm. and, and, and it was around before that, right? It was around in the late 80s, right? We're in the dial-up era of crypto. Yeah, yeah. 
Totally. Yeah. We are in the dial up era. We absolutely are. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's going to get faster, stronger. Everything in our life is going to work on, on top of the blockchain, on top of NFTs, on top of crypto, on top of the metaverse. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, anyway, yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're having a good time over here, but yeah, those were a couple of things, a uh, couple of, couple of fun projects. There was another project I came across this week called earth tones .io That's all about, um, you know, really trying to democratize music. Um, and artists and, and, you know, uh, essentially allow artists to be able to release their music and then, and then their fans can pay them directly instead of having to go through um, some sort of uh, a record label, right? And so there's so many cool things happening um, that, are, that are out there. And, uh, and I have a lot of, I have a lot of uh, faith that the system will figure it out, right? And, um, you know, one thing I used to think when I was young, younger as an entrepreneur, which I haven't, I, I've, I've been an entrepreneur, entrepreneur my whole life. But the first time I really like, really did a big startup was, was this, right, with Mike, right? Um, and that started in 2016. And I used to get a little annoyed that like, oh man, someone else is doing that, <laughs> you know? And man, I should have done that. I had that idea. And the reality is everyone has those ideas. Um, and the other reality is I'm grateful for executors, people that know how to take an idea and bring it to life because- we could come up with, if you have a hundred people on this webinar, we could all come up with a thousand ideas probably in 20 minutes altogether, right? We could just, everyone just puts out their ideas and boom, we could have so many ideas for companies. Um, but it takes, it takes a lot of work to execute and I'm grateful for people to do it. And, and, and I also become, I've become less, um, I don't know, jealous, I guess is the word uh, of seeing that somebody else did something awesome. Um, I'm just excited that that now exists for me to be able to take advantage of now and use. And I don't have to worry about it. I didn't have to build it. <laughs> Building stuff is hard. It's really it hard. Takes um, years, yeah. And it's, and it's risky, but, um, but anyway, guys, thanks for, thanks for joining me and Mike today. I know we talked a little bit about entrepreneurship and some ESG and some fun new projects. Um, we are right around the corner for doing, doing a big release. We're also changing the name of our company, which I'm not going to reveal at this time, but we will reveal that in about a month. So, um, so stand by here we'll, to end this. We'll take you on a little tour. We talked about how Treasure Canyon started. That the treasure chest. Treasure chest yeah. $10,000 oh. grand prize. Yep. There was $10,000 in it. There's other stuff in it now. I'll show you another time. You'll have to come back for the next webinar to see what's inside. So, all right, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks. We'll see you. Take care. Have a wonderful thing.